Hello, my name is Joy Ashby Cornthwaite, and welcome to this special episode of My Diabetes HQ Live. I will be your host today on the heels of our wild winter storms. Our City Changing Diabetes Houston team is here to provide emergency preparedness information and resources to support people living with diabetes who we know are especially vulnerable. An emergency weather event on top of a worldwide pandemic won't stop us from caring for one another. Today's episode is coming up right now. You don't want to miss this. This weekly broadcast is developed and produced by Cities Changing Diabetes volunteers here in Houston and Philadelphia. Our two sister cities are the U.S. members of a global network of 36 cities working to improve diabetes prevention, care, and management all around the world. You can learn more about Cities Changing Diabetes by going to cityschangingdiabetes.com. The purpose of the My Diabetes HQ Live is to help people living with diabetes and their support teams. And today I'm joined by Barbara Kucerik, Director of Strategic Initiatives at Baylor Scott and White Health, as well as my colleagues and fellow Cities Changing Diabetes Houston um, core team members, Serena Valentine, CEO of Core Initiatives and Houston Diabetes Peer Support Coordinate Coordinator, and also Marianne Strobel. Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist and Nurse. She is a member of the Diabetes Disaster Response Coalition, and she was integral in leading the Cities Changing Diabetes Houston's Disaster and Response Action Workgroup. Hi, team. Not much um, can keep Houston down. Our city has experienced many challenges, and yet we continue to show up, help out, and support one another. This time is no different. Today, we're here to share some important and timely information to help viewers, especially those living with and supporting those living with diabetes to navigate this following week, because for many, it's not completely over. We'll begin with a brief overview of the Diabetes Disaster Response Coalition, and then discuss the boots on the ground community resources and ways to access these resources and information about them for our viewers in and around the Houston area. disaster. Many of us in the Houston area currently have power, um, but there are plenty of individuals without water and a lot of resources. So let's begin um, with Marianne. Marianne, if you can just give us a, an overview of the Diabetes Disaster Response Coalition, for um, of which you are a member. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, the Diabetes Disaster Response Coalition was formed uh, shortly after Hurricane Harvey in 2017. And uh, what it is, is it's um, most of the diabetes entities across the nation have come together, formed this coalition in order to have consistent messaging uh, to um, provide um, a way that's updated, uh, where you can find the resources for healthcare providers, people living ways to uh, know about what pharmacies are open, shelters that are opened, anything that you would need to care for diabetes uh, disaster. So the links are very, very valuable. And uh, later on in the show, I know we're going to put up the website address so that people can access it. But uh, because it is almost all the diabetes entities uh, across the nation, uh, a diabetes uh, care dream disasters as well as preparing for and recovering from and looking at them from many different perspectives. Joy, I think you're on mute again. Thank you, Marianne. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the coalition members? Which groups yes, are involved? So so uh, I think we have a slide that shows most of them that are involved. As you can see, uh, the two lead agencies right now are the American Diabetes Association and Insulin for Life USA. 
and then other members of Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists, which uh, used to be known as AADE, which are your di diabetes educators, and, uh, and many, many more. The insulin companies, the, uh, so its physicians are involved. We even have the Diabetes College Network. So, you know, we're looking at all types of diabetes and uh, from all very different age levels, perspectives throughout the lifespan. So they're mm -hmm. there for everybody living with diabetes. Yeah, and the importance of the agencies working together. Um, Marianne or Barb, can you, can you all discuss that a little bit? How you take well, different well, roles? One of the, yeah, one of the things that was a pivotal point in creating the DDRC was of course to have consistent messaging. One of the things that we found going through Hurricane Harvey is, you know, everybody, you know, wanted to help and we're so grateful for all the help that came from so many different areas. But, um, you know, sometimes um, there could have been some information that was maybe delayed from one agency or another and, and wasn't the most updated. Because of the DDRC being a coalition, you know, all of this information comes to one place and then it is created with one consistent message. And I think that's really helpful to people because in the middle of an event, the last thing you want to do is just get bits and pieces and maybe some old information. And, you know, that just complicates things even more uh, when you only have limited access to uh, whether it is a phone or even text messages or Internet. Uh, as we saw with uh, many people uh, during Hurricane Maria down in Puerto Rico, they only had limited availability. The last thing you want to do is be going to an inaccurate phone number or website. So I think one of the greatest things that they've done is come together with this consistent messaging. Okay, that's And super. I would also, oh, sorry. I was going to also throw in there, Marianne, just efficiencies, right? It just really helped getting... Um, access and resources to people who really needed them most, right? It helped with prioritizing where things should go so that everything didn't go all to one place and then move to another. Yeah. It really helped with um, allocating resources and getting them to the people who needed them. Exactly. Right, and, and because they can have this uh, communication between all of these different agencies and levels, it really helps because as we know during some of these events, there might be pockets of uh, supplies or resources in one area, and it's not even, you know, where they need to go, but how can they go? You know, what what are the roads like? What are the transportation? What are the logistics that are involved? And that's one of the things we learned from Harvey. Um, as you know, here in Houston, we had uh, the ability to get some more insulin and supplies into Houston. However, both of our airports were closed, and most of the roads were impassable. So we actually had to retrieve product from um, and supplies from Austin, from the Austin airport and find a way to get it down and actually give it to Texas Search and Rescue who were able to then get in a boat actually and, and take some of these supplies. So the only way that that happens though efficiently is to have all of these agencies connected. Exactly. So for many, um, this particular weather, weather event was a surprise. And on top of the short notice, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on employment, financial pressures, it made it difficult for people to prepare. So Marianne mentioned um, necessity that we often take for granted, which is the telephone access. Barb, will you start us off with some personal and local resources that help people stay connected? Absolutely, Joy. Since we're so dependent on technology for information and staying connected, um, we're going to begin with access to technology and linking to resources because we really take for granted that information is at our fingertips nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a slide that shows telephone and internet access. And um, you can see that um, AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon have um, extended their unlimited um, domestic talk, text, and data, AT&T through tomorrow, February 21st, T-Mobile and Verizon through today. So this includes not only those with plans, but those with the prepaid plans. That's super. And um, just how important is that for individuals who may feel that 
um, they can't look up resources or they can't call out for help. How important is that that they've done this? Oh, I think it's key, right, Joy? Because that's really one of our lifelines to getting information, to getting information, getting information out, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, our viewers appreciate the notice, I'm sure, because I know that for our clinics, we didn't know about this information. Um, so while we're thinking outside the box um, in terms of donations, perhaps individuals can um, donate uh, prepaid cards at next uh, disaster. Um, in addition to lacking resources for accessing the information, many people have struggled with food security. So we have Serena here today to talk to us about access to necessary food and nutrition, especially here in Houston. Uh, yeah, so um, the Houston Food Bank, uh, it has a, a full network of agencies. So uh, it's, it's very important in disaster to be able to access them. Uh, through the provision of food resources before, during, and after emergencies, and also all year round. So uh, I believe we have a slide for the food bank. So uh, the, here's the website for uh, Houston Food Bank, access and text access. So you can enter your uh, zip code, find agencies, uh, find the agencies that are closer to you, their hours, and any other information that you need. If you don't have a computer, it's still accessible via text. Uh, you would text to the phone number 855-308-2282. That's 855-308-2282. So uh, the Houston Food Bank will definitely provide information about the nearest agencies for emergency food supplies in six different languages. So there's, you know, there's so many different languages that you can access. It's English, Spanish, Vietnamese, simplified Chinese, French, and Arabic. So um, also for people who are not in the Houston area um, and you, you've experienced food insecurity, you can go to feedingamerica.org to find the, the local resources. Thank you so much, Serena. That's really, really important information, especially for families out there um, who are struggling. Just enter your zip code to find the agencies nearest to you. So now turning our attention to another human need, water. So as I said in the beginning, while most Houstonians have seen a return of power services, many in the greater Houston area are still without adequate water. Um, others are under a uh, boil notice. Um, Marianne, can you talk to us about the Houston Boil Notice? Yes, we can, there's actually a website that you could go to. Um, I don't know if we have a slide on that. I think we do. Yes, it's Harris County Boil Notice Interactive Map. And uh, you'll be able just to search by your zip code, your neighborhood, or by your address. Um, I know that even on the news, they've actually had a phone number uh, where you could text and you could put the word water in. I gave that a try yesterday. That worked really well. That was uh, from our local news station. Um, I actually also looked on my water bill and I was able to uh, go into their website and they had a link there as well. So there's a couple of different ways that you can access that. But certainly, uh, you know, as the weather warms here, uh, you don't want to be you know, submitting yourself to getting sick from uh, your water. And uh, so please pay close attention to uh, looking to see if you are affected. And my recollection is that uh, they will give you uh, specific instructions on how long you are to boil that. It does have to be at a rolling boil. Uh, keep in mind that beside uh, using that water for yourself, uh, you should also use that for any pets that you have. And, you know, be careful with things like brushing your teeth. You know, you, you want to make sure that you're using pure water for that as well. So it's a couple of different things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Thanks for making notice of the pets and um, brushing your teeth. Small <laughs> things that, you know, that people may not uh, know and consider. And the importance of boiling that water, Marianne, just for clarification. So is it, you know, well, I think it looks clean. Can I go ahead and have it or? Um, no. Yeah. You want to follow the directions that are, you know, 
pushed out on these websites. My my recollection, I'm not an expert in, in this field. So with that disclaimer, I will just say that what I learned on the news was that it has to be at a rolling boil. So, and they showed that on the television, you know, rolling boil. I mean, it's an active, active boil. And they said, once it starts with that boil, has to be for at least two minutes. And then you have to cool it for at least 30 minutes. Um, using things like these filter pitchers that we have uh, are not going to um, get it uh, to the point of being safe to drink. You know, they're nice to use in other times, but when we have situations like this, that will not be adequate. Also, one of the other things that they did mention on the news was don't be using your filtered water from your refrigerator and, and, and your ice from your refrigerators. You know, that's all going to have to be changed out. So uh, any ice that you have in there or water that's coming out of your refrigerator is not for you to drink and use. Uh, so you're going to have to discard that and then work on getting that uh, fixed once, you know, the uh, water boil notice is over. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marianne, for breaking that down for us. So in addition to tech and basic food and water needs, many people have realized that they have missed or not been able to fill prescriptions or on low or are even low on supplies. And pharmacies and other health agencies um, like durable medical equipment companies that may send you your supplies via mail or delivery um, may have been impacted. But Barb, our first trained pharmacist, on my diabetes HQ live and provide us with some guidance there. Thank you, Joy. So a great online resource to look to see whether your pharmacy is opened or what pharmacies are opened in your area are rxopen.org. And we have a slide up on that, right? So if you pull up this slide or this website, you can actually then um, click on one of the dots that are, is near your, um, your home and it'll give you the address and phone number of the pharmacy. And so this is a great resource um, if you don't have, um, if you're not near your local pharmacy or you can't get a hold of the pharmacy that you typically use. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, go ahead. Uh, oftentimes I'm asked, Barb, um, what if I have, what if my neighborhood pharmacy, it's a Walgreens? What if I have my prescription at that Walgreens? Can I go to a different one? So yeah, pharmacies can transfer prescriptions and especially in times of emergencies, pharmacists are really going to go out of their way to help people with doing that. The other thing is that, you know, if you um, don't, aren't, aren't able to do that, but you have your prescription bottle, you can take that to a pharmacy and a pharmacist can do an emergency um, supply. You know, if, especially for medicines such as insulin or other diabetes medications, pharmacists can give sometimes 72 hours or up to 30 days supply, depending on the situation. So pharmacies have that flexibility. Wow, that's really valuable information. Thank you so much. I'm, you know, I'm sure that viewers perhaps who are even clinicians um, or, um, or patients themselves or caregivers for patients may not even know that they have that option. But you know, even if you go to a local pharmacy that isn't a national chain, you can take your prescription to um, a pharmacy located near you. Fantastic. And then the other thing, Joy, just to mention is that a lot of pharmacies also have delivery services, especially those local ones that aren't part of a chain. They often have delivery services. So, you know, that's another option in these times when people can't get out to get their medicines to see if the pharmacies are delivering. Okay. Wow. That's really great. Thank you so much. I think that's fantastic. Um, so the other, um, another network that you can dip into that sometimes we may have forgotten about is the telehealth option for our physicians and medical teams, even if we, we can't get um, a hold of us. Marianne, can you start talking about um, that option? Uh, are you talking about uh, reaching your physician and getting a visit via telehealth? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's mostly what mo most of our physicians um, had been doing because of COVID, of course. Uh, but uh, it's been a lot easier to get a visit with your physician because um, of the ease of pretty much staying more on time, I think, is what's what's opened up some some more uh, accessibility. 
Uh, a lot of times, you know, when you're visiting with your physician or your provider in person, sometimes the office uh, gets backed up, especially later in the day if people are a little late for their appointments and such like, like that. But what I'm hearing from my providers is that it's working so much better because they're able to stay more on time. And so therefore they're actually able to see a couple of more people every day than they normally might have. So it's been really good. I don't think I've heard from any of my patients that they've had um, a, uh, a, a less favorable experience meeting with their providers by telehealth. And in fact, uh, unfortunately for myself, I've had to had a telehealth visit with a provider. And that was, of course, the first time I've ever had to do that. And I, I was a little, you know, um, thinking that I didn't know how well that was going to work out. But I'll tell you, it was just great. And we were able to meet uh, by, by telehealth and uh, get the problem uh, looked at and uh, and get a resolution very very quickly i was very very pleased with the service so not only hearing about it but using it firsthand i, I can tell you it's just it's been wonderful and, and i i don't know might even stay around after we get through COVID. i'm not sure but it, it certainly is a great option mm -hmm. and thank you marianne and thank you for that um personal sort of reflection for that for people who may not feel secure or feel, you know, like they should, they should do it. But like you said, it could bring immediate care um, yes. to you, especially if you, there's some relief issues that you have right now yes. that you can address by going into clinic. Um, Serena, in, in um, previous broadcasts, you shared a couple of really important tips um, regarding planning for visits. Can you just share kind of what a person should do when planning for a telehealth visit for immediate care. Uh, sure. So uh, when you're preparing for a telehealth visit, uh, what you need to do is to think of what's the, your most immediate concern, as you all have been uh, speaking about. For example, uh, prescription refills, those are very important, especially during a disaster, uh, because you don't want to be out of medicine and can't get it from anyone or anywhere. So um, you also want to save more long-term goals and details for when you're able to schedule an in-person visit. Like, you know, you want to talk to your doctor about, uh, I think I want to uh, plan, plan to exercise more, you know, things that you can sit and think about on your own. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny, but it's like, those right. are for, are yeah. quick, you know, you can't just start, you know, and, and some people are close with their doctors, they talk with them about everything, but that's not the specific time to do that. So every, those visits are primarily for your most immediate needs and not for uh, uh, long discussions, you know, <laughs> some people would like to do. And, um, you know, you just want to make sure you get those needs immediately addressed. So, uh Keep, keep in mind, just do the most important things that are pressing at the time. Yeah, especially for now during, you know, when you may need something right the second because of um, water safety and, and refill right. the medications and things like that. Um, so, Barb, what if um, people are often asked, what if my doctor is too busy? What do I do then? You know, Joy, I think that's a great point because there's a lot of other telehealth visits that can occur, right? Um, diabetes education, you can see a nurse practitioner via telehealth, a social worker, community health worker. So there's a lot of options um, to see people outside providers to get some of those things that you may want to be talking about, right, Serena? You can talk about those maybe with some other health uh, extenders of the healthcare team and let the providers um, focus on the um, immediate needs that need to happen for the patient, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And you know, your, your um, physician assistants, your nurse practitioner, um, your community health worker, they can all meet with and communicate with your, um, with your main clinician as well to get your needs addressed so they can be your advocate during this time. So I'm gonna pull up um, for the team here just a summary of all of your uh, recommendations for resources. And then if you if you um, want to expand on that just a little bit, I invite you all to to just chime in and and um, and expand if you didn't have 
if you have a, another thing to say. So we've got telephones check within your zip code um, with your carrier. So it looks like the carriers have assigned zip codes that are impacted by the disaster. And so check with your local carrier um, to see if your zip code is in that group. And the DDRC online has access to all of these resources and more. Um, the Houston Food Bank, you can find help or even volunteer. There's a Harris uh, County Boil Notice website where you can check your area down to your Zoom all the way into your address to see if you're still impacted. Um, go to rxopen.org to find local open pharmacies and also healthcare services. Um, and telehealth visits may be a really important lifeline during this time to get um, in time, immediate check-ins um, with your clinicians and your physician offices. How did I do? Did great. Awesome. <laughs> okay, super. And um, in case you are not in need of even um, any immediate resources or tangible items, um, Marianne or Barb, can you discuss, um, you know, how someone can reach out just to talk to someone? I think it's one of the things that we uh, didn't always think about right away when we we're in the midst of, uh, of a disaster or an emergency is how important it is to be able to address those concerns that people have a, a way to talk to somebody about them. Of course, we're all fearful when we're in the middle of, you know, losing our resources and, and our utilities. And, uh, and so not having uh, someone to talk to can make that situation seem even worse. So I know that we've got a slide with some information on, I don't know if you can pull that up, about emotional support. It's the Disaster Distress Helpline. And um, it is opened every day of the year, 24 seven. And it will be able to help people who are experiencing emotional distress. And uh, there's the phone number right there. And um, I just can't say enough about how important it is to you know, be able to reach out to somebody if you are having some anxiety as we all do experience during these times of disaster. So it's just a wonderful resource that's there. And, and of course, I'll also you know, push this toward Barb to expand on that a little bit and, and how important it is also to stay connected with, you know, like your uh, diabetes care and education specialist, if you have someone you know, that you're able to reach out to, they're, they're always willing to, uh, to hear and to help uh, provide you with the correct resources of where you can reach out. So I'll, I'll send that your way, Barb, if you want to expand on that a bit. So what I wanted to add as well is we talked about this um, emotional support line for people who are listening here, but they may also want to share it with others as well, because you may recognize a family member or someone who you're trying to help, but you can't, re you know, you can't necessarily have the time to spend with them. This is a great resource as well for, to um, shout out to others, you know, to share with others. Good idea. Yeah, because a lot of people may not even recognize that they're, you know, when you're in sort of activated, um, response crisis mode, you may not even realize that you're you're being emotionally taxed. And Serena, I know that the diabetes peer support um, team is still available. I know that you had um, some uh, concerns too with power and water and all of those things, but um, how has the uh, diabetes peer support been there for for individuals? Uh, well, uh, needless to say, without the power or the uh, the right internet connections, it was hard to connect with them. But I tried. Anytime I got a little inch of little, you know, Wi-Fi, <laughs> I tried to post something on the group inside the Facebook group that we have, and that's the Houston Diabetes Peer Support Program on Facebook. Um, I, and anytime I got a chance, I tried to post something like, "Hey, how's everyone doing?" Uh, you know, little memes like keep calm and stay safe, you know, and try to post as much as I can for different things around the city where people can get help and stuff like that. So 
I, I try, try my best. <laughs> Yeah, and I did. And I, I did see, you know, if you weren't able to do something, I saw that other peer supporters actually posted because, you know, peer support is really emotion is really important. Um, it allows us to sort of uh, the collective, they call it the collective wisdom of others. Um, and so that was really nice to see that other people were reaching out, offering, you know, warm food, um, a warm place to sleep for others. So don't forget your peer support networks. They're very, very important. Um, and join the Houston peer support team. Yes. Um, or a peer support um, team near you, community near you. Okay. Thank you guys so much. This was so very important. Um, and thank you, our viewers, for all waking up to um, watch us and to um, help one another support recovery from the winter storms. Um, we have an incredible panel of helpers here. I am always in awe of the work that all you, um, these three women do um, around the state. Um, and we hope that this morning has opened everyone's eyes to concerns related to the foundational basic needs of those living with diabetes as well um, as we continue to move towards a return to care and wellness. We hope that all of you will reach out to help whenever you are needed um, and reach out for help uh, if you do need it. We do have a quick survey on YouTube and Facebook where we would like to get your feedback on this program as well as recommendations for future episodes. Please make My Diabetes HQ Live better by filling out the survey. And mark your calendars next week. We will be broadcasting. Um, it's always Saturday, 10 a.m. Central Time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And we will hear from Harris County Public Health colleague um, and Cities Changing Diabetes volunteer, Portia Carter. She will host on caregiving. So thank you for being a big part of the My Diabetes HQ community. We'll see you next time.